dynamic speakers for you this afternoon. <laughs> Set the bar for you already. <laughs> and um, what we're hoping to be able to do is maybe have a few questions after each talk, depending upon the length of the talks. And then we will have 15 minutes, plus or minus, at the end to do a, a panel dialogue and to ask any or all of the speakers questions that you would like to um, respond to. A couple of commercials. Um, we have some handouts out front if you're interested in them or we will hopefully be also posting them on the Division of Aquatic Resources web page that are related to some of the talks you're be going to be hearing about today, um, including the talk about the effects of rotational closures, about uh, just marine protected areas in Hawaii, where they are, what they are, and what they're not. Um, and status and trends of Maui's coral reefs, a slippery slope to slime, and some others. Um, in addition, we have some technical reports that are available that Eric will be telling you about with some of the other studies that have been done. So if you're interested in more information, there is a lot, and we can get you more. Um, and the, um, at the end of the discussion, we'll also talk a little bit about next year being the International Year of the Reef as well. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, who is Eric Brown, um, comes to us from Kaulapapa. He is a marine ecologist with the National Park Service at Kaulapapa National Park and formerly worked as a research associate with the Division of Aquatic Resources. Well, this will be a little bit of an experiment for me here because I won't be able to see the slides except right in front of me. So if I'm missing something or I'm a little off key here, you just have to forgive me. First of all, good afternoon and aloha everyone. Hopefully everyone can hear me. I do tend to project reasonably well. And you'll notice that I'm not the first author on this particular presentation. Alan Friedlander is. And he's off diving, as I should probably be. And uh, so I'll try and do my best to give you the information that we have here today in the time presented. And what I want to talk about is a study that we conducted since 2002 where we tried to determine the fish habitat utilization patterns and the efficacy of marine protected areas in Hawaii using an integrated coral reef ecosystem mapping and monitoring program. Okay, and you can see our co-authors here come from a variety of different agencies. First, I'll start off with a little bit of an outline of the talk. I'm going to start with a brief overview of Hawaii's system of MPAs, or marine protected areas, then talk a little bit about the mapping, the sample design that we use to take advantage of that, and the assessment of the fish assemblage characteristics to try and get at this elusive fish habitat utilization pattern that we're seeing both inside and outside the marine protected areas, and ultimately getting at that question of how well are these MPAs are working. And then I'll finish off with a little bit about MPA design criteria. Now in Hawaii, and we'll probably be focusing in on the MPAs that are under the jurisdiction or purview of the Division of Aquatic Resources. There are a total of 12 MPAs, 11 of them are marine life conservation districts, and one Hawaii Island Laboratory Refuge at, if I can even point to it here, I'm not getting much of a pointer there, but at Moku Oloi on the island of Oahu. So at each one of these different reserves, we conducted sampling inside and outside of the reserve to try and get at this question of how well were the fish assemblage stocks doing in each one of the respective areas. And 
just to give you a little more background information on the reserves themselves, they varied in terms of size, the year that they were established, and the level of protection. And we sorted this table here based upon size. So the top um, protected area, Keala Kakua, was 128 hectares in size, established in 1969, and had a moderate level of protection all the way down to Wailea Bay and the island of Oahu, excuse me, on Hawaii, with 14 hectares of size with low levels of protection after it was established in 1985. The ones that are shaded in gray there have high levels of protection, which means they're pretty much no-take zones. Low levels could be something like just simple gear restrictions or certain areas that were off limits, okay? So each one of these areas varied quite substantially since they were first established. But before we could actually go in and start sampling them, we had to utilize a few new techniques. And perhaps the most important one was the development of a benthic habitat map, both inside and outside of each one of the areas. And we started, this actually took place in the late 1990s and was completed in the year 2000, so relatively recent development. We started with these ortho-rectified aerial photographs that were true color images with a 1.2 meter pixel resolution. These images were then visually interpreted. Basically, when they were heads up digitizing, somebody would sit there with a little crayon and draw around the particular habitat as to how they interpret it. If they thought it was sand, they would draw a little box around it and say it was sand habitat. Then the, the habitats were classified using a hierarchical classification scheme into zone, structure, and cover, with a minimum mapping unit of about 0.4 hectares, or one acre. And they achieved 90% accuracy, which is pretty good, which means that in the ground truthing following that, they would go back to the habitats, or particular random ones, and say, how well did we accurately assess that habitat from the image? And you can see from that little habitat chart down below that quite a few habitats were delineated. Well, we simplified that tremendously because we weren't going to sample in every single little habitat that Noah came up with. We used a spatially explicit sampling design, and it was set up so it was randomly stratified by both habitat type and management regime. And for the habitat type, we grouped it into four categories. Coral cover, which was greater than 10%, other hard bottom, which was less than 10%, macroalgae that could be either on hard or soft bottom, but dominated by macroalgae, and sandy habitats. For management regimes, we use open access areas, marine protected areas, and fisheries management areas. Now, I'll be primarily focusing this talk on the contrast between the open access and marine protected areas, because not all MPAs had a fisheries management area associated with it or close by. For the data collection, we had fish censuses that were 25 meters by 5 meters in dimension. And I have a little cartoon down there in the lower right-hand corner, which I could just point to the dang thing, that showed kind of how the whole corridor was laid out. It was a belt transect that a diver swam through and enumerated both the size, the identification of the fish, and also the number of each species. For the habitat metrics, primarily the biotic cover of coral, algae, and invertebrates, primarily macroinvertebrates, we used these one meter square quadrats with random points on it that we placed at intervals along the transect. And we took five of those, each treated as a subsample, along this whole belt corridor. For the abiotic parameters, we used depth, habitat complexity, which we measured using this chain and tape method, or called rugosity. I don't know if you can see that. It's kind of over on the right middle section of the photo there, that person laying down that spool. And then we also post-classified the habitat type. So if it was predominantly coral, we would label it as a coral reef, aggregated reef, or something like that. Just to kind of give you an idea how the whole sampling scheme would be laid out for a particular MPA and its corresponding um, open access areas, here's the Waikiki Marine Life Conservation District. And you'll see there the polygon pretty much in the middle of the chart showing the boundaries of that conservation district. Then adjacent to that, going around Diamond Head, you'll see the fisheries management area. And this is a rotational closure that actually Ivor will be speaking about a little bit later. And then the habitats kind of underlaying all of that. And each one of the black dots represents an individual sample that we took. So we tried to partition the sampling effort so that we had X number of samples between about 10 and 15 in each one of the different habitat types, 
and management regimes. You can see that we simplified the habitat types to the four basic categories. First thing we did was just kind of take a look at the spatial representation of the data. And kind of for the remainder of this talk, I'll be focusing in on fish biomass in tons per hectare. This was a very complex program, so I'll just be trying to take a subset of the data and just showing you some of the more salient points. And you can see from this kind of overlay here that the Marine Life Conservation District, in terms of these bubble plots, tended to have much higher levels of biomass inside the conservation zone than outside. For a lot of people, that's pretty intuitive, and that's nice. You know, you protect an area, and you saw from this morning speaker that once you set aside sanctuaries or zones where no fishing is allowed, guess what? The fish do much better. Now looking at it a little more statistically here, what we've done here is we've got habitat type on the bottom into uncolonized, macroalgae, colonized, and sand. And remember, actually I can go back to the previous slide, two previous slides, you'll see here that some of the management zones do not have all of the habitat types represented. So sometimes it was difficult to compare inside and out if not all the habitat types were present in each of the management regimes. Let's go to this slide. But just from this particular slide, you can see that once you protected the area, the biomass in this case was significantly higher than either the fisheries management area or the open access areas. And that was true for both the uncolonized and macroalgae habitats. Once you pooled all the data, and this particular slide, I love thinking about it from the effort. It took three years of field work, about 950 transects that we sampled throughout the state, to come up with just this one basic slide. <laughs> and in essence, what it's showing here is that no matter what habitat type you're in, if you protect the area, fish biomass levels are significantly higher. Okay? And what's even more important about this type of data is that now we have levels. We have quantifiable levels saying, well, how much better does an MPA work than outside in open access areas? And you can see some cases it's two to three times higher. Now looking at it by consumer guild or trophic guild, well, you can see here we split it up into primary consumers, secondary consumers, and apex or top level predators. There were quite a few interesting patterns in terms of the proportion of biomass in each one of the different habitat types. For instance, the highest biomass of apex predators occurred on colonized hard bottom. But the highest proportion of biomass occurred in the sandy habitat. This was quite a shock to us, but it kind of made us think that maybe sand was a very important parameter or habitat type to be used as a corridor, as a transient zone, let's say, between hard bottom substrates. Another thing that's very interesting is that apex predators did not do well in macroalgae or uncolonized hard bottom habitats. And once you took a look at it in terms of how they fared, in terms of the consumer gills between marine protected areas and the actual open access areas, you can really see some very striking differences here between the different consumer gills. For example, primary consumers about two to three times higher, actually in this case almost three times higher biomass levels inside than outside. Consumers or secondary consumers, about one and a half times, but the group that benefited the most from the protected level status were apex predators, almost nine to a little over nine times higher inside the bio, uh, marine protected area than outside. So that was very important. Now we started to want to bring in some of the fold of other habitat characteristics what other factors might influence biomass among all the locations. And here we use the stepwise multiple regression model, um, just the hard bottom substrates to try and tease out what things were really driving these higher levels of biomass. Habitat complexity explained at least a quarter of the variation that we saw, so that was a very important thing. Protection also was very important. But macroalgae and sand actually had negative relationships, so that if you had higher levels of macroalgae, you had lower levels of fish biomass. And this is going to become a very important part of the story with, say, with invasive species, invasive algal species. Taking a look at just the MPAs now, another factor really played out very strongly, and that was depth, both for fish species richness and fish biomass. So as you went down and increased in depth, you tended to increase the fish species richness as well as the fish biomass. Now we are interested in looking at, well, if habitat complexity is really critical here, 
How does it you know, vary across the different ranges of habitat complexity? And what we see here looking at biomass again is that if you increase rugosity or topographical complexity of the habitat, biomass increased correspondingly. And it was also different for the MPAs versus the open access areas, with MPAs having much higher levels of biomass corresponding to the open access areas adjacent to it. Well, now we're getting down to the nitty gritty here, and we're starting to look at actually individual MLCDs or MPAs. I'm going to use those words pretty much interchangeably here. What you see is not all MLCDs are created equal, certainly in relation to the open access areas that we paired them against. And what this chart shows is the ratio of biomass inside the MLCD or MPA versus outside. Some areas like Hanauma Bay, eight and a half times higher inside than outside. That's very, very significant. I mean, you're talking about fishing pressure outside of Hanauma Bay that is so strong that it's just basically reducing the biomass down to nothing. I mean, almost, almost minimal levels. And this chart is also organized so that the levels of, or the zones, I should say the MLCDs with the highest level of protection, tended to fall out on the bottom of the chart. Whereas those with low to medium size protection or me moderate levels of protection tended to fare not so well, maybe about one to one and a half times higher levels of biomass inside versus outside. Interestingly enough, we put this figure over here of high human use. That refers to primarily visitor traffic. So it could be a confounding variable here where Hanauma Bay has a lot of fish feeding going on. That's <laughs> really how much time. Five? Beautiful. Doing great. Okay. <laughs> Much higher levels primarily do something maybe that's outside of our control. Okay, we've covered several different aspects of the MLCDs, levels of protections. Now I want to focus in on the size of the MLCD because this is something that's oftentimes brought up. And what we've done here is we've ranked the different sizes, this actual physical size in terms of the acreage, the hectare size. And we've ranked the different metrics, in this case, biomass, species richness, species diversity, and the number of individuals greater than 15 centimeters. And what you'll see is there's a pretty strong relationship that if you increase the size, it's kind of a strange way to look at this, but the, the MLCDs that are the largest are in the lower left-hand corner of the figure. They tended to have the higher fish assemblage characteristic parameters. In other words, they tend to have higher, higher biomass, greater number of species, species diversity, and more individuals. So that's a very important find, and it was significant. So we we're very interested to see that, because we thought that even though these reserves were quite small, that we wouldn't see this type of effect over such a small scale. So in conclusion here, habitat complexity, protection from fishing, and MPA size were important for various fish assemblage characteristics. Primarily, the greater habitat complexity you had, the higher levels of fishing or protection from fishing, and the larger MPA size all re resulted in generally higher levels of fish assemblage characteristics, at least the ones that we were measuring. Overall, fish biomass was about 2.6 times greater inside the MPA, and apex predators tended to show the greatest response. So they tended to really benefit the, great, the, the most from the MPA. Depth explained most of the variability in the species richness, and this was true primarily in the um, MPAs, but it also was true for some of the open access areas as well. And despite the proven success of no-take reserves, they only account for less than 1% of the nearshore areas in the main Hawaiian Islands. Quite a far cry from what was described this morning for the Philippines, where they have a much greater area than we do in terms of marine reserves. So that gets me to the final slide here talking about some of the design criteria for effective MPAs in Hawaii. These are the things that we've been kind of learning over the years in terms of what's working and what's not. First of all, you want to have a range of habitat complexities, okay? So even a little bit of habitat complexity can result in a little bit higher levels of biomass. By the way, the reason that I did focus a lot on fish biomass is it seems to be a very important parameter from a fisheries perspective and for fish standing stocks. So that's kind of why we've done a lot of this work looking at biomass, but we've also looked at it from fish abundance levels and species richness for bioconservation. Also, a full protection from fishing seems to be beneficial, and it can also be benefited too by being community managed or at least managed at a local level. 
Shoreline to deep habitats are a very important consideration, as well as a mosaic of habitats. And this was shown by including sandy corridors in some of the MPAs, because this served as an important transit zone for a lot of the big predators. Low macroalgae cover. I can't tell you how many times we'd be swimming around in areas with a lot of invasive species, very few fish. So clearly, the less macroalgae cover you have, the better the fish assemblages generally are. And then finally, a little bit about representative wave exposures. You notice from the, one of the earlier slides where I was showing it, an outlier distribution of the different MLCDs, we noticed that there was a very different assemblage structure from the northern communities to the southern ones. Now that doesn't come as too much of a surprise because they're driven quite a bit by wave exposure and so forth. So it is important to take that into consideration that if you're looking for a particular type of fish assemblage, then you've got to consider the different wave exposure regimes. And all of these things can be utilized for not only creating, beautiful, I'm going to just finish up right here, will be utilized for creating not only new MPAs, but also for enhancing some of the existing ones, which has been done in the case of Pupukea. So with that, I can take a few questions. Thank you.